Hello everyone and welcome to the St. Louis Art Museum's Art Speaks program. My name is Jessica Kennedy and I'm the educator for adult learning here at the museum. I'm going to wait just a moment uh, to make sure that we let all of our guests tune in. But in the meantime, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A section lo located at the bottom of your screen. You can use this at any time to ask questions during the program. We'll select some of the questions to answer and we will try our best to answer as many as we can in the allotted time. Today's talk, The Fascinating History of the Reclining Pan, will be given by Judy Mann. Judy has been at the museum since 1988 and has served as its curator of European art to 1800 since 1997. In that time, she has reinstalled the collections of medieval, Renaissance, Baroque, and 18th century European painting and sculpture at least three times, and has organized multiple major international exhibitions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Judy. Okay, here I am. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, it's uh, wonderful to have uh, so many uh, reclining pan fans uh, joining us today, um, and I will take us to the sculpture immediately. Um, some of you may remember longtime visitors to the museum years and years ago where this uh, sculpture was kind of tucked away where the um, uh, 19th century landscapes are now. And one really didn't get an appreciation of the full uh, sculpture, which will be particularly important uh, today, the way I'm going to talk about it, because it is something that is uh, very three-dimensional, but also has a rather interesting, and in our case, relevant back. So the reclining pan is one of those works of art, uh, was heralded in 1947, the year it entered the museum's collection, as the finest Renaissance sculpture in America by none other than Frederick Hart, an eminent scholar of the Renaissance and particularly known for his work on Michelangelo and uh, Renaissance sculpture. And so uh, this uh, we've looked at it in terms of who made it, why it was made, what function it served, why does it have colored marble, they're all sort, and when it was made, which we still do not know. Um, so it's always raised fascinating issues for us. But today I'm going to look at another aspect of it, uh, the, the documentation or knowledge we have that uh, tells us who interacted with the sculpture, either knew it or had something to do it, because it's a rather interesting parade uh, through uh, first uh, the history, Roman history, and then into the Renaissance and into the 20th century. So the first thing uh, to do is to look at the back because we're really beginning to talk about it as a piece of marble, because obviously that's how uh, it began. But it was a piece of marble as this view shows us, perhaps this detail makes a little clearer to us, um, that it was sculpted before, that there is some unrelated sculpture. I'll go back to the full view. Uh, we see from the front, obviously, this very sensuous image of Pan kind of rousing himself from sleep. But on the back, we have striations and curves. Uh, here we have very specifically uh, kind of a fringe. So evidence that this piece of marble was used in some other way. And uh, we know that it was used prior to its being sculpted into the shape of a pan in the 16th century. And in fact, what that was, and I'll come back to this, I think sometimes confusing diagram to people, but um, it, we have, due to research, uh, extensive research and, and very creative research undertaken by our former curator of ancient art, Lisa Chalkmock, and her husband, Adrian Assi, himself a scholar of uh, Roman architecture. Uh, and they were able to, based on actually uh, some very elaborate and accurate scans of the back, um, were able finally to determine that this, uh, the back of the marble was originally part of an enormous frieze, that is a, a sculpted, uh, not in full three dimensions, but a relief sculpture um, that was uh, uh, to the tune of a 13 feet high. 
And what I'm showing you, A, is the view we had of the back before. If you rotate the sculpture so that you are resting it on this lower part, which is down here, um, that orients the relief into the right direction for understanding the relief. Not that um, it's easy to look at that sculpted back and uh, make it out, but through a lot of comparison, uh, looking at uh, pieces of Roman sculpture, Roman relief sculpture, Roman architectural monuments uh, from the uh, sort of first through the third centuries, uh, they were able to determine that this uh, was a piece uh, from a, an enormous relief that depicted uh, most likely the god Mars accompanied by some unidentified uh, goddess. And furthermore, they surmised that it's very likely that it was toward the end of the second century, and that places it logically under the rule of Marcus Aurelius. And I'm showing you a bust in the Glyptotech in Munich, a very famous bust of the philosopher emperor Marcus Aurelius, and perhaps one of the best known uh, features uh, in the city of Rome, this equestrian statue also of Marcus Aurelius, now replaced outside with a replica. The original is inside at the Capitoline uh, Museum. And I think the uh, equestrian statue particularly gives a little insight. Not only does it represent Marcus Aurelius, who ruled from 161 to 180, um, but it shows the kind of level of uh, the kinds of things that were undertaken uh, during his rule, uh, this very sumptuous, quite a feat of bronze casting, this marvelous bronze horse and rider that was then gilded. Um, so uh, it, it tells us of the level of sophistication and um, the kinds of things that he uh, uh, commissioned and, and had built. Um, for example, the arch of Marcus Aurelius, what remains of it in uh, Tripoli, uh, in Libya, um, now uh, denuded uh, of much of its um, uh, original uh, sculptural decoration, but we can um, look at a slightly later, uh, the most uh, probably complete and most beautiful uh, of the remaining uh, triumphal arches, these arches that celebrated uh, usually a, a military victory that were literally doorways through which a procession would come to celebrate uh, this victory. And you can see these large marble panels above. So we're looking at probably a piece that, that played such a role of adornment. We also have for Marcus Aurelius, not himself, but his son Commodus, who uh, uh, built the uh, column of Marcus Aurelius uh, in order to honor his mother and his father. And that too is richly arrayed with uh, sculpture, with figural sculpture. But as I said, the, the piece that we have um, came from a relief that was 13 feet high. Um, and so that means that it adorned a, an enormous building, something that is uh, uh, right now unknown. Um, this is a revelation for scholars, uh, but it tells us the rather auspicious beginnings of this piece of carved up marble. Now, what happened to it in its next, during the medieval period after the Roman Empire fell and uh, all those years until the Renaissance? We really don't know. We believe uh, that um, it was a building that was originally in Rome, and we believe that this uh, piece of marble, whatever form it had in the 16th century when it was chosen to be sculpted into the pan, um, probably stayed in the city of Rome. But other than that, we don't really know. As I said, the whole, this understanding of the back is a whole new look at this uh, sculpture and is going to, we hope, over the years yield some uh, very interesting uh, information. But our next sort of famous encounter, uh, perhaps, uh, is with Michelangelo. Now, we don't know for a fact that Michelangelo himself was directly involved with the creation of the sculpture. Although I can say 
that by uh, 1930, uh, he was uh, uh, the assigned uh, artist for the sculpture. And I'm showing you uh, Michelangelo's Moses, uh, a key element from what was to be a much more massive tomb of Pope Julius II. Uh, some people have thought that th this tomb was the kind of bane of Michelangelo's existence. It is now, uh, it originally was to be this enormous freestanding structure under the dome of the Church of St. Peter's, and now it is a wall tomb much reduced in size uh, in San Pietro in Vincoli in Rome. But the Moses itself is, is a marvelous and, and commanding sculpture. And I think you can easily see, as I have done here, I've taken two details to show that there are uh, obvious visual similarities between the left, very commanding left arm of Moses. Uh, Moses here has sort of spotted, uh, have coming down with the law from uh, God and he spots people uh, celebrating the golden calf and he's about to kind of react to them and he's fixed his gaze and he's clenched his left hand and arm. Uh, and so that muscular arm seems to have been a a point of departure or inspiration for the artist who created the reclining pan. Um, you can note that right now the artist we have associated with the pan is Francesco da Sangallo. Francesco da Sangallo worked directly with Michelangelo in Florence mostly um, and uh, he also uh, worked uh, in Rome. And so um, it could have been that uh, it was done under the guidance of Michelangelo, because as I said, we don't really have a definitive date of creation. On the sculpture itself right now, we use a, a kind of older date of 1535, because um, originally we really had thought, scholars had thought, it was done uh, kind of earlier on in Michelangelo, uh, under Michelangelo's guidance earlier in the century. And now more and more people who've looked and studied and thought about this piece think it was made during the 1570s. But as I said, uh, Francesco da Sangallo lived until 1576, and it's not beyond the realm to think that this direct disciple inspired by Michelangelo created the reclining pan. So it was made most likely in the seventh or eighth decade of the, eight, of the 16th century. What's fascinating is the next encounter uh, of a, a famous personage with our uh, reclining pan. And that is the artist Peter Paul Rubens. Rubens, of course, is Flemish, uh, born in Antwerp in 1577. But uh, for eight years, he was resident in Italy. He came to Italy in 1600 and stayed there until 1608. He got word that his mother was quite ill and he uh, left probably earlier than he had originally intended. While he was in Rome, and, and he wasn't just in Rome, he traveled throughout. He was um, uh, under the employ of the Duke of Mantua for a couple of years. But in Rome, he really uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, absorbed and studied uh, constantly antique sculpture. Uh, he was himself a collector. He was noted uh, for his considerable knowledge of antiquities, of uh, uh, sophisticated knowledge. And he was uh, uh, erudite. He, um, there are stories, perhaps apocryphal stories, that he would have uh, readings from the Aeneid while he was painting or drawing, and while he was also having a learned discussion on some point of philosophy or some point of antiquities, whatever. But um, he was known for his depth and breadth of his knowledge. So it's really significant to see that <clears throat> Peter Paul Rubens uh, studied, spent some time with our reclining pan. <clears throat> we don't know where it was when he encountered it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it was uh, uh, probably, uh, he drew it, obviously, probably sometime between 1602 uh, and 1608. The date assigned to the sheet of 1610 uh, speaks to the fact that this is not exactly a direct drawing. This is a uh, transfer. It was uh, made with a wet sheet of paper that was then uh, 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 
pressed against a chalk drawing and then it was further embellished. And I think you can see how there's some darker, richer red chalk here. He really uh, animates the vine around it. I mean, makes this uh, really an independent work of art, which is also a kind of copy of the reclining pan. So this is a memory work perhaps when he got back to Antwerp. But the important thing is here we are maybe 30 years after the creation of this very marvelous work uh, that it, its origins aren't even known. It was already thought to be an antiquity. And we have another interesting piece of evidence from uh, Peter Paul Rubens. And this uh, was particularly exciting for us because we uh, entertained the possibility of purchasing this drawing back in, in uh, 2010 when it came onto the market. Um, it, it sold for um, over $400,000 and that was uh, a bit beyond what we were able to do, but it still was a, this new revelation, another drawing by Rubens after uh, the um, uh, pan. This seems to have been in direct confrontation with the sculpture and also shows that Michelangelo, uh, sorry, that Rubens was looking down on it. So it gives us a little hint of how it might have been displayed or, or down in a grotto or something like that when it was in Rome. But other than that, we have very little information as to where Rubens encountered it. But we know the next sort of important uh, personage uh, who was affiliated with the uh, reclining pan. And that was uh, Maffeo Barberini, who became Pope Urban VIII in 1624. Because in an inventory recorded by uh, a, another Antonio Barberini in 1638, this sculpture is listed. So we know that by 1638, the sculpture was in the uh, collection of the Barberini and they themselves, uh, Maffeo Barberini shown here in a commanding and very beautiful portrait by an artist that he commissioned uh, for a number of important projects, Pietro da Cortona, one of the great gifted fully Baroque artists of the early 17th century. Um, and uh, Barberini himself, a poet, um, really very conversant with uh, the arts and a collector and a scholar of uh, note. Uh, so he had, uh, we presume it was under the, under Maffeo Barberini that the uh, sculpture entered the Barberini collection. But again, we, we don't know the, that we can't fill in yet those gaps between the time that, um, well, the time was created, the time that Rubens saw it, and then the time that uh, uh, Barberini had it. But it was a, a on display in uh, the Palazzo Barberini in Rome. Um, and um, it was at that time, there's a, a well-published photograph of it showing it in the uh, Palazzo Barberini. Interesting that the, the photograph uh, was uh, done with a, a rather modest amount of lighting. And so the sculpture almost looks like it's made from black marble. In fact, another scholar then uh, published the sculpture as having been made from black marble, but it's not. But it was a sight and people knew it and it was a great, it was held to be a great Michelangelo. So we know that it was in the uh, Palazzo Barberini uh, up until um, that, well, at the time of that inventory and then up until the last, sort of event, the last uh, uh, person to interact with the sculpture in a, a certain way is Benito Mussolini, um, a rather, <laughs> taking a rather uh, dramatic turn here in, in terms of looking at great artists, at these erudite and sophisticated collectors. And now we have uh, the prime minister of Italy uh, from, six, uh, from 16, right, 1922 to uh, 1943. Uh, and um, he is the last player in our sort of story of great uh, or notable people involved with the reclining pan because uh, in the six, uh, 1930s, the Barberini family uh, was really in need of cash and uh, they needed 
to um, uh, sell off um, some of their uh, collection. And they first succeeded in obtaining a royal decree. And in, uh, so the king uh, granted them permission in 1934 to do this. Uh, but they needed also a pr state approval. They needed the legislature to endorse uh, this sale and give them that final approval. And so it was Mussolini uh, who kind of negotiated a deal uh, that brought on board support for the allowing. And, and you have to think about there were some notable um, works of art, uh, famed works of art in this collection, and to allow them to leave Italy um, that, you know, particularly for a country that sort of defined itself by its tradition and richness in the arts. Um, but he negotiated a deal where a group of uh, uh, some select objects actually came to the state of Italy. Um, and they are now part of the state collections that are housed in uh, the Palazzo Barberini and the Palazzo Corsini in Rome. And so it was that enabling legislation that allowed the um, pieces, several pieces, uh, to be purchased, um, including um, our uh, uh, reclining pan, which was uh, bought and arrived in St. Louis in 1947. So that's the kind of illustrious um, history of the encounters of various people with this uh, really fascinating uh, sculpture that has lots and lots more to tell us if we have the time and the uh, resources to really uh, properly investigate. So can I now take questions or? Yes, yes. yes thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions, uh, please type them into the Q&A. There's two little bubbles at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type anything in there. Um, and while we're waiting for that, I actually had a quick question uh, for you, Judy, going back to the very beginning of your talk. And was it fairly common practice to have marble be reused the way um, that this one was, where it came from something that was already already carved? Um, yes, it, it ha we can't, it hasn't really been thoroughly documented. I mean, there are some other examples, uh, notable examples, but yes, it, I think that was a just ready, it was a quarry there in Rome. And uh, um, the project I'm working on now, this um, exhibition about artists who painted on pieces of, of stone. Uh, some of the pieces of stone that people uh, painted on were in fact antiquities that had been sawn up and made into panels that were usable for artists. So um, th this is just not something that um, has been as extensively studied, partly because a lot of times uh, in creating the new work of art, there was nothing left of that original, so you don't have the telltale marks mm. of its original function where we, we do here, which is makes it pretty exciting. And the fact, again, um, I don't want to minimize it. it. It's an extraordinary thing that we have discovered with this uh, sculpture because it tells us this enormous building um, of great expense, of great prominence that no one knew anything about. And also would have been the first over life-size image of a god we know. Um, for, so it, it's a, a stunning importance. So you can imagine all those other sculptures probably also created out of similar things, but because we don't have the evidence, we can't really understand where they came from. Thank you. We have quite a few questions. So I'm going to um, try and, and start from the top here. Um, someone asked, did this enter the SLAM collection as Michelangelo? Um, really good question. I don't think so. I think that it was from the time it entered. I should check this if it's apparent in our records. It was for many years uh, attributed to Giovann Antonio Montorsoli. He, another protege of Michelangelo, and it was given to Montorsoli because of the colored marble. The, uh, the hooves, the horns are made of separate type of marble that was inserted. And um, Montorsoli happens to be the only artist we really have other examples of this, although they're really quite different in a way. So um, it, it's, uh, that was the attribution. I'm pretty sure that was what it carried, um, if not when it entered closely thereafter. Uh, another 
uh, viewer asks, is there significance to the hide tied around Pan's neck? Um, it's a goat skin. Um, I'm sure there is. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I should. Um, but uh, it is a kind of standard element often with uh, Pan. But uh, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, someone would, um, could you, or would you please say again how it was that the statue was available for purchase in 1947? Well, we haven't been able to um, get all of the links from the time it, it was sold. Um, so we're not sure. There are a number of other sculptures or works of art, not only sculpture, that were sold. Um, there were several dealers who uh, were there in Italy able to purchase and then um, sell within the United States. So it was, there was a middleman, uh, clearly a middle person uh, who sold it to the museum, um, but um, we don't have that clear documentation. So. Um, let's see another, um, how did scholars conclude that Michelangelo was not the sculptor? Well, the same arm, <laughs> uh, I, well, first of all, let's just say that no two scholars see this alike. So, you know, um, you're often in the situation where someone is saying, see, clearly this is not by this artist. And to my eye, that is not so clearly. Um, so um, it, it, there is a range of opinion, but I think really it lacks the kind of uh, sort of energy. And even in the, let's, if we can go back, to that uh, slide of we've had we've had several requests to go back to Pan so we don't have to stare at Mussolini. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes, my apologies. <laughs> um, but the um, if you look at Michelangelo's arm and you look, uh, this does seem a kind of pale reflection of it. It, it doesn't. I, I think to my eye too. And you know, again, we this is based on looking and looking and looking at many, many things, but um, it doesn't seem to have the kind of Christmas and energy that uh, the Michelangelo has. Um, uh, the thing that um, caused me to change the attribution to uh, San Gallo had more to do with the facial features and some very clear um, links to other examples of this kind of expression and the kind the crispness of the carving in the face. But um, several scholars um, disagree with me, so it's not a slam dunk. We don't know for sure. But I think at this point, of course, we have a major Michelangelo person here in town, Bill Wallace at Washington University, and he too um, is skeptical that this could possibly be by Michelangelo. Okay. Um, someone else asks, uh, what research is currently going on into the questions about this statue? Um, unfortunately, um, I don't know. Well, I can't say. I know that there is there are several scholars who work on this. Uh, one of them here in town and teaches at Webster. Um, you know, I, I wish that uh, there were more being done on the antique side. Um, many of you know Lisa Chakmak left the museum to take on a position at the Art Institute of Chicago and is, has many other things to do now. And her husband has a very different job. So they're themselves not able to pursue it. They were extremely excited about it. I know that some of their colleagues had been interested, but to my knowledge, I, uh, you know, I mean, there's always scholarship being done. I'm sure people work on this, but I'm unaware of it, so. Um, lastly, we're almost, let's say we maybe have time for one or two more questions. Um, and I think you've actually already mentioned this, but someone has asked, has the, has paint been added to the sculpture, for example, on the hooves of Pan? Uh, no, uh, there aren't uh, traces of, of uh, paint. The question is when the hooves were added, because the um, x-rays have shown that the kind of uh, fittings that that uh, connect the hooves to the um, leg are not 16th century, they're later. Um, uh, my opinion is they were done in the 17th century uh, when there was this assumption that uh, many antique artists, and, and again, the 17th century was looking at this as if it were an antiquity. And so the assumption was that colored marble was used. What we're thinking is it got damaged and then new hooves needed to be added, but we don't know 
know that all for sure. Um, there are people who specialize in um, the kind of chisel work that is used in different centuries. There are people who specialize in those kinds of marble and, uh, excuse me, metal fittings that are used in this kind of case. Um, if, if we had all the time and resources in the world, I've always wanted to convene a conference on this sculpture to have our uh, uh, conservators take off the hooves. And, you know, because it, it's been changed over time. You can even see maybe in this slide that uh, there's a lot of fill. Can you see right here? There's a obvious line that's fill between uh, the horn and the forehead. So we're not even sure that's the original horn there. Uh, generally, Pam, has larger horns. This is not a typical uh, horn for Pan. So there are lots of questions we have about this sculpture that we would love to understand better. All right. Well, thank you. That's that's all our time right now. Thank you so much, Judy. That was wonderful. And I, I know that this is a fan favorite. So um, I really appreciate you taking time to talk about it. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we will be taking a break for the next few weeks, but in the new year, I encourage you to check under the events tab on the museum's website for more upcoming Art Speaks programs. Thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks, bye. Bye.